All right, gang, you ready for video number five in our Complex Ion series? We're getting some meat and potatoes going on here, right? Uh, this is going to be the third video in the possible types of reactions that we can undergo. So the first one was acid-base behavior. The second one was uh, can we dissolve precipitates by adding complex ions and looking at the, the crazy chemistry. Now we're going to look at complex ion versus precipitate. Death match 2000, baby. So if I have a metal ion and I add a ligand, right? probably going to be some anion most likely. It doesn't have to be an anion. It could be neutral, a neutral molecule or an anion, but a potential ligand. If I add that to that metal ion, let's say it's a lead plus two ion or iron plus three or a cobalt plus two, it doesn't matter what it is. Will that added species form a solid, a precipitate, or will it form a complex ion? How do you know? We have to be able to discern that. Uh, two scenarios we're going to look at. I'm going to start with the easy one, then we'll look at the more complicated one, and we're going to explore those in our lab, or we can actually do it. It's like, hey, let's add this. Oh, look, we got a precipitate. Well, let's add it this time. Oh, look, we got a complex ion that time. How do you tell the difference in lab? Well, how do you know you formed a precipitate? You got a clarity change, right? It went from these, these clear solutions to this, you know, not clear mixture, whether it's, you know, opaque or not. And you can see, a lot of times you'll see the little particles in there. Whereas complex ions, you, there's no particles, right? Um, but they form these beautiful colors. Oh, man, the complex ions form beautiful colors. Um, the last part of uh, this particular chapter, we'll talk about the beautiful colors that complex ions make uh, in solution. Um, that I'm going to make that extra credit. Um, I'm not going to have that uh, as, uh, you know, the homework for that will be considered extra credit. It's not part of the class. But it's such cool chemistry, so I'll do some videos on it because I can do it while I'm here. And if you want to watch those videos and do the homework, you can do that for some extra credit. Not a lot, but it's neat stuff. Just do it for the learning aspect of it. All right, here we go. How do you know if you have a complex ion versus a precipitate? It really comes down to the concentration of the species you're adding. Right? Remember, to form a complex ion... You need excess of the ligand, and you need high concentration. Now, how do you define high concentration? Depends who you talk to, right? So we're going to use about 4 molar as the breaking point, but it's kind of a gray area, right? So we'll say, hey, if you're adding low concentration of that species, we'll say less, you know, it's probably going to be 0.1 molar, 1 molar. Most of the time in lab, you'll see anywhere from 0.1 to 1 molar. That's considered low concentration. But since I'm going to do a distinct breaking point between low and high, I'm going to make that 4 molar. Just going to we're gonna give you a number. So we're going to say anything less than 4 molar will be considered low concentration. And anything 4 molar or higher will be considered high concentration of species. Remember, there's a, there's a vague gray area in the middle there. right? Most of the time, you'll see the 0.1 to 1 molar. And if I'm adding a, something and I want a complex ion, it's probably going to be 6 molar or something. Obviously high. All right. If you've got a lower concentration, you cannot form the complex ion. So only the precipitate is possible. Right? So you check your KSP table, check your solubility table, see if that precipitate can happen. You don't have to worry about the complex ion. But if you're at 4, 5, 6 molar or higher, you're going to go, ah, crud. Now i got to look at the can of complex ion form. Complex ions are possible. But remember, not every metal ion can form complex ions. Right? Only the select few. So you need to check your KF table. And if you see that a complex ion is a viable option, at that high concentration, boom, you're going to get the complex ion over the precipitate. But if no complex ion can happen, and no matter what concentration, if that complex ion cannot form because it doesn't exist because that metal can't form complex ions with that, you can check your coordination number table. Where is that thing? Let's see if we can find it. So remember we showed you this before where you predict the coordination number? So you can look and see here's the ligands, right? And then look at the different metals. So if you don't see the metal on there, then that's not going to be a viable combination, and, and you can't form the complex ion. And it's not a complete list, but for tests it will be. But if you see the combination, boom, right? You can form that complex ion. Now, if no complex ion is possible, right, then a precipitate will be your only viable option. 
So let's look at a couple of examples here. We'll start with an easy one and not do math with it. And then we'll do a harder one and, and do what we did before where we add the equations together using Hess's law and all the manipulations we do of the K values. So I'm going to erase this board, put up some fun stuff for you. All right, you ready for the first way of looking at the precipitate versus complex ion death match 2000? Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Depends on the concentration of what you're adding. So let's take the lead 2 ion. Let's add some hydroxide to it, All right? So in case in case A here, let's say that's 0.1 molar. So it could be <coughs> 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, 0.1 molar potassium hydroxide. You're looking at the hydroxide ion concentration, and we would consider that low, All right? And then in case B, we'll take the same lead ion and we'll add the same hydroxide, but let's say we do 6 molar, right? So let's say 6 molar sodium hydroxide. We would consider that a high concentration of hydroxide. So in this case, that's low. No, there's no complex ion possible. In the high, there is a complex ion possible. So we have to look it up on the table. If we don't see the complex ion, then we'll just get the precipitate. Over here, we can't get the complex ion, so we can only get the precipitate. Right? So this will be PPT only. And this will be possible complex ion. If not, you would go with the precipitate. All right, so lead 2 and hydroxide, you can kind of see if you look on your solubility chart, hydroxides tend to be very insoluble unless it's with an alkali metal or something. So the lead, we're, and you're going to form the neutral solid. So lead's a 2, hydroxide's a minus 1, so that picks up 2 hydroxide. So we're going to get the lead 2 hydroxide precipitate, right? And you could look up the KSP value for that with that insane thing. I think that's on here. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, right on the top. So if you look at your KSP table, the very top lead 2 hydroxide has a 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15th value, right? That's pretty insoluble, right? That's uh, We would consider that a slightly soluble solid in, in this class. In uh, first semester general chemistry, or intro, we would just call that insoluble. All right. All right, let's take it the second case here. Six molar. All right, the complex ion is possible. We have a high enough concentration of hydroxide to form it, but we need to see if it can. We need to see if it can. So look on your coordination number. Look up the hydroxide as a potential ligand. And you see the lead 2 there? Yeah, I see the lead 2. What's the coordination number? 3. So that can pick up 3 hydroxides. That's how you predict how many you can. Now here, with the solid, you can predict how many to create electrical neutrality. But the complex ion, you don't know how many of those ligands it can pick up. So you have to look on the coordination number table. So that's going to pick up three. Oh, did somebody catch my mistake in part A? Oh, what did your coach forget in part A? Right there. Right? How many hydroxides we got over there? We got two. They don't just appear magically. I can't snap my fingers and go, poof, there's an extra hydroxide. I'd be a billionaire if I could just snap my fingers and make stuff like that. There again needs to be a two there. Oh, <laughs> man, rookie error, baby. Happens to us all. All right, so this is going to pick up three because it's a coordination number of three on that table. So we're going to get the lead with three hydroxide. And lead's a plus two. There's three of the negative one, so two minus three is minus one. So you get, again, the trihydroxoplumate two ion. Nice. Now, if the lead and the hydroxide did not form a complex ion, you didn't see that combination on the table, then you would just get the precipitate, right, up in part one. So that's a kind of a qualitative overview on how to find these things. And then you could look up the KSP and KF values for that. Um, but let's, let's put this up quantitatively in the next problem and see how you do on it. Life's going to get a little more complicated here. So in, in the last example we did, the species that we added could form a direct precipitate or a direct complex ion with the lead 2 and the hydroxide. In this case, the species we're adding can form a direct complex ion in high concentrations. We're going to use that 4 molars of breaking point again. 
but in lower concentrations, it cannot form a direct precipitate. It's not going to look intuitively obvious that you could get a precipitate out of you. Like, why would that form? Because it would be like a neutral species, like ammonia. Right? You're not going to get a precipitate with ammonia, right? You, you need an amine with the cation to get a precipitate, right? You'd think directly you do, but in this scenario, the species we're adding at low concentrations, we can't get the uh, complex ion, but we can indirectly get a precipitate because that particular species we're adding has weakly acidic or weakly basic behavior. It's a weak acid or a weak base that undergoes its own equilibrium that forms a secondary species that then reacts with the metal to form a precipitate. Rewind that. The species you're adding can function as a weak acid or a weak base in solution, undergo its own equilibria, forming a different ion. And that different ion that forms then reacts with the metal ion to form the precipitate. Do I need to rewind that a third time? <laughs> Let's, you got to see it. I mean, it's crazy. So this is a little harder. All right. Let's take a look at the nickel-2 ion in both scenarios here. We've got a high concentration of ammonia here, 6 molar, high. And we've got a low concentration of ammonia here, low. Now remember, at low concentrations, you cannot get a complex ion. Right? So we're going to do no complex ion possible. Even if it's a viable outcome on there, you can't do it because remember, you need high concentrations and excess of the ligand to form it. But the high concentration, complex ions possible. There, complex ions possible in that one. And here, the nickel with the ammonia, you're like, what precipitate would you, you can't form a, a precipitate between nickel 2 and ammonia directly. But we can indirectly, right? Because that ammonia is a weak base. So let's do the easy one. Let's look at part A real quick. We can form a complex ion. We've got a high enough concentration. So get your coordination number chart. There we go. Aquaman's holding it. Hold it, Aquaman. Hold it for them. All right. So here's your, look up your ligand. Here's my ammonia. You know, just find your ligand. Look for your metal. So we're looking for, I forgot our metal. Nickel. All right. So nickel two. And do you see nickel two in here? There it is right there. You see the nickel two? That's got a coordination number of six. So that's going to pick up six. I'll balance it correctly this time. So that's going to pick up six ammonias under that high concentration to form the complex ion directly. And ammonia is neutral, so we're going to get a plus two overall. Because the nickel's a plus two, plus all of those are zero, you get a plus two overall. So you get the hexaamine, hexaamine nickel two ion. Somebody's knocking at my door. I'll be right back. Young children all over. All right, crisis averted. <laughs> Here we go. So we got the hexaamine and nickel two ion up there, right? Because we could do it at a high concentration. Now down here, we cannot get, uh, there's no precipitate between, no precipitate between the nickel and the ammonia directly, All right? In the last problem, the hydroxide ion could directly form a precipitate with the lead 2 ion, but not, because that's not a cation. I mean, it's not an anion, right? So that's not going to happen. But it can indirectly. So I'm going to put a but here. But ammonia is a weak base. So ammonia undergoes equilibria in water, right? It ionizes in water to form the ammonium ion and the hydroxide ion. <gasps> and the hydroxide ion that it forms can then form a precipitate with the nickel. Ooh, it's a two-step tango here, right? I, I don't dance. I don't know what a two-step tango is. Is a weak base. And indirectly forms a precipitate with nickel. So let's look at that on the next board. Let's show you how the ammonia ionizes in water, step one 
forming the hydroxide ion. And in step two, that hydroxide ion will react with the nickel two ion to form the nickel two hydroxide precipitate. That's equation two. We add those two equations together to get an overall equation forming the nickel two hydroxide precipitate. And we can calculate an overall K value. If you are feeling confident, do that for me real quick before I do it. And I'll erase this board and put it up. This is gonna get crazy. All right, as you can tell, I did a whole lot on the board here. Let's walk you through my brain. I like to teach. I usually don't like using notes when I teach because I like you, uh, especially when we're in lecture, to see my brain in real live action and how it thinks, right? Rather than just eh, slapping it on there. Um, so some of these, I put the answer up ahead of time if it takes a long time to draw. I don't want you to sit here and watch me draw with the videos, but some things you need to see it broken down. So let's break this down. This is going to be important for the equilibrium reactions lab. All right. So we've got the ammonia, right? So let's take the ammonia. I'll do this in black. And remember, this is low concentration. So this is, uh, what was it, one molar? So we've got a low concentration of ammonia. We cannot form that complex ion because it's too low of a concentration. So the ammonia has nobody to play with, right? It can't play with the nickel ion because the nickel's like, there's not enough of you. I don't want anything to do with you. So the nickel looks around in solution. Imagine yourself, I'm not the nickel, the um, ammonia. Imagine yourself in that test tube or whatever, and you're the ammonia molecule. And there's nickel ions floating around. There's not enough of me. He doesn't want me. And you look around. Is there anybody else at the party to talk to? And you're like, there's nobody else here except water, right? But since the ammonia is a weak base, it can actually ionize in the water, right? Functions as a weak base, right? You look at your principal species, right? We've got nickel two ions, we've got ammonia molecules, we've got water molecules. If the ammonia won't play, can't play with the nickel, if the nickel won't play with the ammonia, the ammonia can play with the water. Do you see that? But if there's a lot of ammonia, then the nickel will say, okay, there's enough of you. We'll do it directly and form a complex ion. You can think weird like I do or not. <laughs> it's very logical. Look at the principal species and look at the possibilities. So this ammonia is a weak base. So it's going to be taking an H plus from water back to our chapter 16 acid base stuff. And that'll give us the, yep, that'll become uh, yeah, NH4 plus. plus the hydroxide. Oh, we didn't think about that before. We got secondary species due to this equilibrium of the weakly basic ammonia. So now we have NH4 plus and OH minus, and we have to go, will one of those react with a nickel? Well, nickel's a plus two, right? So let me, let me set this down as equation two. We've got this nickel ion Right? Originally, we had that nickel floating around. Can the nickel react? See, nickel ain't going to react with the ammonia, right? It's too low of a concentration. It's not going to do anything with water. It's not going to do anything with the ammonium ion because they're both positive. They're going to read, they're going to move, you get near that in the in solution, they're like, yeah, get away from me, right? But the hydroxide, oh, ho, 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 ho. that can come down and react with the nickel to form the nickel 2 hydroxide precipitate. Now, now, that's a low concentration. Remember, this is low concentration. That's even lower concentration. This is a weak base. So there's just a teeny tiny amount of hydroxide. Not even close to form a complex ion. You could not form a complex ion in. There is a tiny amount of hydroxide. But it can certainly react with the nickel to form the solid. So that's a plus two, the hydroxide's a minus one. So two hydroxides get picked up there to form the nickel two hydroxide precipitate. Whoa, bet you didn't anticipate that one, did ya? Right. Watch out, the secondary reactions can get you. Look to check and see if those species added can function as weak acids or weak bases uh, in low concentrations, right? In high concentrations, you're going straight to the complex side. Low concentrations gets a little more hairy. All right, now let's just add those two together, but what are the K values here? Let's take a look. All right, let's do this in green. Let's see, we got the ammonia ionizing in water forming OH minus. That's a prototypical weak base. So this is K1.
is KB, right? That's just the KB for ammonia, straight up. How about this one? This one, we're forming a solid, all right? So we've got a solid, so it has to be some function of the KSP. But KSP is the solubility product. It's a solid dissolving. So this is backwards, right? That's a backwards KSP. So K2 is 1 over the KSP, right? 1 over the KSP. You get it? You got it? You good? Now let's add these babies together. Let's, let's add them together. Let's do the overall equation. But remember, when we add equations together, we want to get rid of the species in common between them. So what does equation 1 and equation 2 have in common? The hydroxide. So when I add these together, I need to get the same number of hydroxides on both sides of the equation so they cancel out. Well, I've got one hydroxide ion on the right over in the equation uh, 1, and i got two hydroxides on the left because I needed two of them for electrical balance to form the precipitate, right? So I need to multiply equation 1 by 2 in order to get the two hydroxides on the right-hand side so that they cancel out. So I'm going to take this whole equation, and I'm going to multiply it by 2. Therefore, I'll get two ammonias, two waters, two ammonium ions, and two hydroxides. Those two hydroxides are going to cancel those two hydroxides. See that? So let's draw the overall equation and then calculate the overall K value to see if this is viable. All right, so I've got uh, two, I got times two, so I'm gonna get two ammonias plus two waters, right? I'm multiplying everything across equation one by two. I have one nickel, and then the hydroxides cancel out. On the right-hand side of the arrow, I'm gonna have two of the ammonium ions. The hydroxides cancel out, and I have one of the precipitate. Oh, ho, ho! Crazy, crazy stuff, right? So, two ammonias, plus two waters, plus the nickel-2 ion, gives us two ammonium ions and the nickel-2 hydroxide precipitate. And again, that's all because we had a low concentration of the ammonia. High concentration of ammonia, we just went straight to the complex ion. I want you to pause your video, look up the KB value for ammonia on your KB table, look up the KSP table for the nickel-2 hydroxide precipitate on your KSP table, and I want you to calculate the overall K value for this. Using our tricks, our Hess's Law, and our manipulations, and all that fun stuff. This is what your equilibrium reactions lab is going to be all about. Combining different things, and actually performing it, and seeing it happen. So you could do the theory ahead of time, and if your K value is a lot bigger than 1, you could predict, well, this is probably going to happen. If it's a lot less than 1, it's probably not going to happen. So if you predict that theoretically it's going to happen and you go do it in the lab and you actually see the colors change or you see a precipitate form or you see the precipitate go away just like you predicted, you're like, yeah, feeling smart, baby. Do it. Calculate your overall K value and tell me whether this is a favorable or unfavorable, unfavorable, unfavorable process or product dominant or reactant dominant. Let's go for it. Ready, set, go. Bravo, bravo. Did you get it? Did you get it? Let's take a look. Let's add these two equations together, right? So the overall K value, I had a red pen, it's over here, will be K1 times K2. Hess's law. You gotta love it, right? So what is K1? K1 is the KB of ammonia, but I multiplied it by 2. So I need to square it. Right, I multiplied it by 2, so the hydroxide ions cancel out. So this will be KB squared of ammonia. And then equation 2 
was the formation of the nickel 2 hydroxide precipitate, which is the reverse of it dissolving. Remember, KSPs are solids dissolving. So forming the solid is the flip-flop, the reverse of it. So that's 1 over KSP. Or you could just go KSP to the minus 1. Either way, you can go 1 over KSP or KSP to the minus 1. Did you look up those values? Let's do it. So what's KB for ammonia? You might have that memorized by now. It's pretty common. So these are KBs. Do you see ammonia right there? 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Ammonia is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And we're going to square that puppy because we multiplied that equation by 2. Let's look up the KSP value for the nickel 2 hydroxide precipitate. So get your KSP table, the very cluttered one with the 0.1 font. Let's look up nickel 2 hydroxide. So where is nickel under N, 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 N? There's only two of them. There's the nickel 2 carbonate, nickel 2 hydroxide. Nickel 2 hydroxide, 2.0 times 10 to the minus 15th. Do you see? Do you see? Nickel 2 hydroxide right there. There's the name. There's the formula. 2.0 times 10 to the minus 15th. 2.0 times 10 to the minus 15th. Right? Or you could go 1.8 times 10 minus 5th squared over 2.0 times 10 minus 15th. I don't care how you set it up mathematically. It doesn't matter. So I'm kind of flip flop. I'm doing both ways on here so you can see how both ways function. Two significant figures. Two significant figures. Punch this out, right? So this is going to be around 10 to the minus 10. And then we're dividing by 10 to the 15. So we subtract negative 15. So it should be around 10 to the 5th range-ish, 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 6th range. You can kind of anticipate ahead of time if you have those silly math tricks, right? Um, so what do you get? Punch that out. 1.6. Two zero times ten to the fifth. One point six two zero times ten to the fifth. Good to two sig figs. That's closer to one point six. So I'm going to leave it as one point six times ten to the fifth. And that's not quite as dramatic as what we saw before um, with complex ions. You're talking, you know, we were getting ten to the thirty eighth and crazy things like that. But one point six times ten to the fifth is still a lot bigger than one. Right? That's way bigger than one. Not bigger than 10 to the 10, so I wouldn't say it goes to completion, but this is going to be very, very heavily product favored. So if I went ahead and did this reaction in lab and I took uh, some, like, say, some nickel 2 nitrate solution or something and added some one molar ammonia to it, I would probably expect to see some particles form right? Whatever the color of those particles are, I can't predict the color of that until we finished uh, the complex ion chapter, chapter 24, but it's doable. You can do this. Practice it, and we're going to do a lot of it with the equilibrium reactions lab. I'm going to go enjoy the rest of this rainy day with my kids and my pets. Yay!